uh, yeah, I'm Matt Johansson. This is my esteemed colleague, Jonathan Kuzkos. We work at White Hat Security. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the top 10 thing we do every year? Just by showing hands. Cool, a few of you. All right, so uh, yeah, we'll get right into it, I guess. Right? So uh, yeah, this is an old file thing, so <laughs> the, uh, I, I wasn't in charge of these slides, and this guy broke down his Photoshop skills and updated it for me. Uh, yeah, so I run uh, White Hat Threat Research Center out of Houston, Texas. Uh, we're headquartered down in uh, Santa Clara, California, but we have about 50, 55 web hackers in Houston. Uh, I've done the speaking thing a few times. I've been a live conference you've seen here. Uh, used to do pen testing a whole bunch, still try to in my free time, but I went to one of the dark sides management, right? Because I like to say, at least it's not sales. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm hiring a bunch. Uh, we're always hiring in Houston if any of you are from that way or willing to move that way or it's any better and looking for kind of foot into web hacking, you can come talk to me afterwards. Yeah, I'm kind of following this guy's footsteps. So I've been a senior engineer for a while, moving into management. Um, but I'm going to be heading up our EU division that we're still looking for engineering to So he's going to be for two more weeks, and then I'm he's not for the States. Um, in the meantime, I also do a lot of the world of the AppSec scene in Houston. So if anyone's interested in speaking out in Houston, I'm definitely looking for our OWASP chapter. Hit me up. We'll talk some stuff. Just a little bit of White Hat real quick, right? They sent us here, so obligatory, right? Uh, so those of you who don't know what uh, White Hat does, we are a web application security uh, software as a service scanner, right? So we're just scanning websites all day, every day for vulnerabilities. We have about 35,000 websites in your service, uh, just piles and piles of vulnerabilities that we're just scanning all day, so it's kind of the data that we come to the table with. Um, yeah, we're at, at about 350 points, you know. So about the top 10, right? So I saw a few hands go up that are familiar with this. We do this every year. Um, so we, it's a community-driven type uh, of event. We put uh, just a blog post out, it's kind of a living blog post, and we collect a whole bunch of new web packing techniques from the year that are just submitted from Twitter and comments and stuff like that. Uh, and then we put out a survey for the community to vote on that list. Usually we have somewhere between 50 and 80 new techniques that make the major list. Uh, and that list gets whittled down to about 15 from that survey. Uh, and then we take that 15 to a, a panel of expert judges and we order it into a actual top 10 that is ordered and all that kind of stuff, right? All communities, nothing like that. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we, we, we actually have to think a lot of that, right? So, uh, these are the past year's winners. Uh, we've been doing this since 2006. Um, you'll see crypto has kind of been king recently. Uh, crime and beefs were just Crazy, earth-shattering, right? Uh, I have a feeling crypto is going to take the 2014 <laughs> list. If, uh, if I was a betting man, I think Parkley would probably be up there. Uh, yeah, betting market and crypto attack is still a technique that, even though in 2010 it was new, it's still part of a lot of these other techniques uh, as like a foundation crypto attack. Uh, but Gift Warmline was right when, right when I was starting to, to do a lot of this web pen testing. How do you guys remember that? That was, that was awesome. If you're a web pen tester, that was really fun. Uh, yeah, and excess time of the day, right? So without further ado, this is this year's top 10 list. So crypto has been dethroned. Uh, a new cross-site scripting technique came out this year called mutation excess, took the, took the lead, but crypto does have three of the top five. So <laughs> it's still really uh, well-respected research because it's really hard and very academic, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in it up here when I go through a lot of these things, but we're going to go through these kind of one by one. We're going to fly through 10 through 6, because uh, each of these is basically their own black hat talk, and we have 45 minutes, so, uh, and maybe about 40 now, right? So we're going to fly through 10 through 6 real quick, and then we're going to kind of try to dive a little bit deeper into 5 through 1. If at any point you think that we're talking way too fast, I guarantee this will be it. You can feel free to just yell at us and throw us up if you really want to know something. But uh, at the bottom of all these, if you want to like, take a picture of the slide, we have the slides available, you can download later. At the bottom of them, we'll have a link and you can go and actually watch the actual talk by the people who actually did the research and not us, but just pretend to kind of learn about the stuff. So, okay, cool. So, number 10. Yeah, just going to start off. Number 10 is the HTML5 part of this building. Now, with HTML5, you have the ability to use local storage, which allows us to save a lot more data from our inside to the camera, which is one of four kilobytes of things. Now, the current limits for that is 2.5 megabytes in Chrome, 5 megabytes in Android, and 10 megabytes in Android, and 10 megabytes in Android. Now, the specification recommends that shared subdomains of the same host all have their own 
and a little sandbox limits. Let Chrome Safari and Unix Explorer all ignore this. Firefox will share a 10 megabyte cap across all domains, but um, the others that I mentioned will just let you use the maximum local storage over and over for each fictitious domain supply. So for us, we created a little concept, uh, www.fillthis.com. Basically, when you navigate to it, it's going to fill your hard drive with data, fictitious domains, iterate them over and over and over again. You run it in the VM, you can it. Oh, go to it. Uh, like, seriously, if you go to that, it will exploit this. It's still vulnerable. And so. it builds up the picture, no less. So. App pictures. Because <laughs> it's the internet. Uh, so, uh, number nine, this is White Hat's own Robert R. St. Hanston. Actually, I should say Austin's own. He's an Austin local. He's kind of floating around here. You, you'll see him walk around. He's speaking tomorrow, I believe. Um, he figured out a way, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but he figured out a way to decloak some Tor hidden services and try to figure out where uh, their actual IP address and actual location were. Uh, he, he, there was uh, two or three different ways that he kind of was, was doing this. Uh, he were kind of monitoring uh, up and down time in, in known shared hosting locations. And there's a few others. If you're, if you're interested in Tor hidden services and, and the anonymity and all that kind of stuff, he wrote a very good blog post about it. And, like I said, you can check that out later. So number eight is a large-scale empirical study to find DOM XSS across like the Alexa top thousand um, through automated means. So they found about 6,000 unique vulnerabilities across 480 domains, um, showing that just about 1.6% of the Alexa top 5,000 carry at least one DOM-based XSS. Completely through automated means only. That number's probably much higher, but there's no manual testing done in that. Number seven is some um, Idiot and Jeremiah, uh, Grossman, yeah, this is the old picture that is undoctored. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jeremiah and I uh, found a cool way to distribute some JavaScript, right? So cross-site scripting, the whole point of cross-site scripting is to get your JavaScript into someone else's browser. And we thought that, that was too hard, and so we just gave an ad network some money, and they did it for us. And just uh, we actually went and did this and gave some ad network our JavaScript and created kind of our... A botnet out of JavaScript and DOS ourselves. We just pointed all those computers at ourselves, took down our own website, and then we actually did a follow up on this uh, after Black Hat, and we um, we we called Akamai. And we said, hey, you know, we DOS ourselves with this little AWS server, and it had to deny service protection. And yeah, we DOS ourselves, but who cares, right? Let's call the, the big boys, right? And they, that's what they do is DOS protection. And, hey, guys, you have a website that we can attack that kind of runs through your pipes and is protected? And they said, yeah, it's www.akamai.com. And they let us kind of try to go after their home page. So uh, it's one of those videos. We did the, the follow-up there, too. We didn't actually take down Akamai's <laughs> website. But uh, the economics of this are really interesting. It's really cheap. And if you're interested in it, feel free to come ask me about it or go watch the, the old videos. So I'm going to assume that like, probably a wide majority of this crowd is familiar with like, military energy attacks. Um, out of band data retrieval is an expansion on that found by Tamir Ganeso and Alexei Osipov. They displayed this at Black Hat EU last year. And basically, what it is is a way to um, build an entity tag that is both part file contents and part URL. So, with this out of band method, you can actually access non well form data before the XML parser validates the document. Um, with the exception of binary, obviously. If you're a bug bounty person or anything like that, that's learned about that. It's everywhere. Uh, People just aren't doing XML entities right, so you can make a good amount of money. Okay, so in the top five, we're going to go a little bit deeper in these, okay? Uh, like I said, I'm not a crypto guy, so like a lot of this is going to be me pretending to know what these guys found. Okay, I can kind of talk about it at a high level, though. So first, number five, weaknesses in RC4. Uh, this is gaining a lot more traction in recent weeks for pretty obvious reasons uh, with SSL3 and Poodle and all that kind of stuff, right? But um, so for those of you who don't know, right, SSL and TLS, just really quickly, um, the important part, I think, for an application security conference that I'm going to point out here is that sometimes less than obvious is that uh, you think SSL and TLS, you think HTTPS, right? You think your website, like you go to a website, it's got an HTTPS, right? But TLS is actually used in a lot of different other protocols. Uh, it's the same kind of encryption algorithms and things that are used uh, for secure IMAP and POP and SMTP and, you know, WPA. So this, this, this weakness in RC4, okay, yeah, you think SSL, that is the big elephant in the room, but it's used uh, elsewhere, right? So, okay. And then, yeah, each algorithm, so RC4 is an algorithm, each one has a number of cipher suites underneath it. So at the time of this research, uh, this was some of the stats from ICSI, 
uh, where about 50% of websites that were using TLS were using RC4 algorithms. Uh, so it, part of this was because that if we went back a bunch of slides, last year's winner uh, was crime or beast, I can't remember, it was either crime or beast was weaknesses in CBC, which is kind of the other major alternative to RC4. And so a lot of the security people's suggestions was, hey, move to RC4, because CBC is broken, right? So that adoption number went skyrocketed, and then we found weaknesses in RC4, okay, right? So you're seeing a trend here. Uh, so, oh, it was beast, and then this year's Lucky 13. It's on my own slide, I should have looked. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's very, very popular, Cypher Suite uh, algorithm and the, and the lot. Okay, so there's two different attacks that these researchers uh, have wrote these giant academic white papers about. If you're like a crypto person, go get these white papers. They're really, really in depth, right? The main takeaway that we're going to uh, see of this is, okay, this attack is, the first attack is a multi-session attack, right? So that means it needs multiple TLS handshakes, right? So it needs, like, you go to a website, there's a TLS handshake. You have to kill that, do it again. Kill that, do it again. You have to keep doing these handshakes, okay? Um, so, two to thirty, who wants to do it real quick in their head? <laughs> you actually need a billion, it's a billion. You need a billion TLS handshakes. Uh, that you're man in the middling here that are using this RC4 algorithm to reliably recover the first 220 of the first 256 bytes of plain text. Okay, so you're starting to see it's a little bit of a theoretical attack, right? This isn't this isn't something that you know the internet's on fire. Uh, let's all go patch, but uh, you know they're kind of proving that it's not as strong as you know we would want it to be, and as computers get faster, as this attack gets better, of course this number is going to get pretty small, right? The reason it's the first 220 to the first 256 is there is some 36 byte padding that just happens uh, in, in these P streams. Um, yeah, and then uh, they, they even proved to get certain bytes reliably. So not the whole 220, but certain bytes, 2 to 24, which I think is around 16 million. So that's, that's even you know, significantly better than a billion, but uh, still really theoretical. Okay. So. Um, the, the only kind of real, if I was trying to make this theoretical thing a real world scenario that would be somewhat feasible, right? So that same, it needs to be that same 256 bytes has to go through a billion, S, you know, handshakes, TLS handshakes, right? Um, so when I try to think of like a scenario where that same thing would go over and over and over again, uh, you can think of something like session cookies, right? Like, you have some known pieces of information about session cookies so that you can kind of, if you're watching, if, you're, if you are in the middle and you are watching a bunch of TLS handshakes, uh, you can put some little JavaScript in the browser and kind of force it to make just requests with this, the same request to the same website with the same session cookie a whole lot of times, a whole lot being a billion, so it's really, you know, the protection here is pretty easy, just don't let a billion requests go off. But, uh, but you know, you, you can start to see that this would be a little bit, a little bit easier, more feasible than just like blanketly trying to decrypt all SSL traffic across the internet. Okay. Uh, I just went through all this. Next. So second one. Um, second attack. The, the big difference between these first two attacks is the second attack is one handshake. So uh, it's a lot of requests, but it's one TLS handshake, right? So it's actually much more reliable because you don't need to redo this whole TLS connection every time, right? Uh, you actually need to do 10 times 2 to the 30 uh, encryptions, but it, if, because math, uh, this is actually a little bit faster than the, the TLS handshake thing. Um, and then, yeah, 6 times 2 to the 30 will, will achieve about 50% reliability. Um, TLS handshake does not need to be rerun. Cool. So. Yeah, very obvious limitations here, right? Uh, I've kind of hit this over the head. Countermeasures. Okay, so countermeasure number one that a lot of people are saying is stop using RC4. This is super unrealistic for a lot of organizations. Okay, yeah, let's just kill this whole algorithm suite. So, you know, for some of you, it is actually that easy, right? You can just switch it. But uh, a lot of people push back, and when we say, hey, stop using RC4, we get a lot of pushback there, right? So if you are stuck in RC4, one of the things you can do you remember how I said there's that 36, pad, uh, 36 byte padding, uh, and you can only get the 220 of the 256? If you, you can manually make that 36 byte padding larger, uh, and then all of a sudden you're pushing real data that they would be trying to steal further into the, the, into the byte stream, and, and you can limit the attack surface there. 
And then the pretty darn obvious one, in my opinion, is just don't let a billion requests go out to the same like, person with the same cookies over and over again, right? Uh, don't let a million go out. Don't let a few thousand go out, right? Like, and then this this goes pretty much away, right? Cool, so number four, a little bit more crypto. Um, so the lucky 13 attack is a new attack against TLS and DTLS that allows another man in the middle attacker to recover plain text, basically. Um, only when separate blockchain and encryption is used. So it's important to note that this one particularly here um, is a flaw in the TLS specification and not so much the implementation. Um, the team behind this research is Kenny Patterson and Ed Melfarden, who also play a role in the research that Matt just uh, discussed for the number five spot. Um, this particular attack applies to all these different versions of TLS and DTLS right here. Um, TLS 1.0 did incorporate uh, fixes to the past patent oracle attacks, but it's still horrible here as well. There are also um, other variants of these TLS and DTLSs out there that their attack wasn't tailored specifically towards, but could be modified for a work on it as well. Um, so they tested it against OpenSSL and GNU TLS. For OpenSSL, a full plain text is <coughs> possible. For GNU TLS, a partial plain text recovery is possible, recovering up to four bits of the last byte of any block of plain text. Um, so, how does it work? You know, it abuses something known as a padding oracle attack, which was our when it 2010. was 2010, I think. Um, so we still see this to this day. Um, padding oracle attack, obviously, is a cryptographic side channel attack on the padding of crypto message, because plain text messages often need to be padded for encryption. Um, on. So this also, in order to properly exploit this, you need to know how HMAX work or uh, hash-based message authentication codes. Now, these typically use either SHA-1, MD5, or SHA-256 as the hashing function. Um, they share similarity in that they all take messages in blocks of 64 bytes. Now, if you go from a 64 block or 64 byte input to a 65 byte input, an entire extra iteration is going to have to occur, which is going to cause a small but measurable, measurable delay. Um, this is a timing attack going on here. Now, you have to do this multiple times, just like uh, for the other one. It's 2 times 10 to the 23rd in this case, so it's about 8 million times. It's still theoretical, man in the middle has to occur, and then you have to send that many similar packets, which doesn't happen in the real world, or in a while at least. Also, the network's going to contain jitter. So, forget doing this over the internet, forget doing this over Wi-Fi. Um, you can probably do it over the LAN, but you still need to measure what is native jitter to the network. Take off. Take all, all the, that information, do some statistical analysis on it, find out what are which would be anomalies of that jitter, and now you know which chunks of data you're actually interfering with. And uh, the price for that is just 16 bytes of encrypted plain text after, after that many requests have gone through. So it's a whole lot of arbitrary work for not a lot of uh, priority. Um, it's a little bit more practical on DTLS because anytime a record fails to decrypt on datagram TLS due to a bad macro or padding error, the TLS server will kill the session. Um, or oh, TLS will do that, I'm sorry. Datagram TLS doesn't do it, so it's a bit more uh, sensible to target DTLS. Do we really need to be worried about this? You know, yes and no. The researcher participated in responsible disclosure, notified the vendors, we got it fixed. However, anything that could improve this research to bring out of the theoretical realm into practicality would cause a huge concern because if you know, like, you place this crazy faith in, like, TLS just upholding, and then something like, yeah, so before we before we move on, this is kind of the end of our encryption fest here. That's kind of really, you know, deep, right? But every, everyone kind of heard about Poodle this week, and what Poodle was kind of attacking was downgrade. It was like a downgrade attack, right? So a lot of the times we see, like, this RC4 and CBC aren't being used as the main algorithm, but they are allowed as an algorithm, and that's when the browser can force a downgrade, like the attacker could force a downgrade, and that's kind of what, what we saw in Poodle, to use a weaker algorithm. Right? So we're showing weaknesses in RC4 and CPC, and you can stop using them, but as, as, if you don't explicitly disallow them to be used, which you're going to break some old browsers and things like that, right? so it's a trade-off. Uh, if you don't disallow them to be used, you can be vulnerable to this, kind of, this kind of downgrade. Really deep dive into that next year, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Google, yeah, exactly. Okay, so number three. So this one is my absolute favorite. How many of you guys saw this talk at Black Hat? I'm just curious. No one. Awesome. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to do my song and dance about it, but I, if you think that it's cool, and I, I hope you will, go watch the Black Eye Talk. He got two standing ovations of Black Eye. I've never seen it before. It was, it was such a good Black Eye Talk. It was really cool research, really creative, right? It's this guy, Paul Stone, um, picks a perfect timing attacks with HTML5. That was 
think the name of the talk was just pick, picks the perfect timing. Uh, super creative stuff, yeah, let's just get right into it, right? So browser history shifting, this is a little bit of a history lesson here, right? So uh, this kind of attack's been around for a really long time. Um, there's a few different ways to do it, but this, this way involved, uh, you know, write a little JavaScript to um, do a timing difference of a page load, right? So gmail.com, for instance, right? Um, if you're logged into gmail.com, it's going to take your browser a significantly longer time to load gmail.com because there's a lot more things to load on the page, right? If you're not logged in, what loads? Username and password, really quick, right? So if you do this timing attack, you can tell if you could force someone with an image tag to just make a request to gmail.com and then measure the time difference of the response, you could start to tell what's going on. But as Cusco just mentioned in the, you know, in the CBC problem is jitter, right? This isn't really reliable over the internet. These timing attacks usually fall, not reliable over the internet. These, these uh, timing attacks usually fall victim to this kind of weird timing stuff, right? Um, so even simpler than that, uh, this was something that I, I think Jeremiah and Rob Gerson were involved in back, back in the day a little bit, uh, was just check the CSS, right? Hey, is that link blue or purple? Cool, and we know if they went to that link or not, right? Just create a bunch of invisible links, check the CSS if it's blue or purple, and then we know which links they visited, right? And then we can browser history sniff, right? Browsers fixed this, fix this in 2010. Modern browsers fixed this in 2010. Uh, if you're using a browser from before 2010, uh, But uh, basically they fix this by saying there's no legitimate reason for checking the CSS color of a link that's never been used in a legitimate purpose, so this is going away. Uh, so that's fixed. It, at the time when it was still vulnerable, something like ad networks and like porn sites were using it pretty significantly. Like that attack that like find the history to more target advertising to you. It's the underbelly of the internet, right? Okay, so what's all this new again, right? So we thought we fixed this. This whole browser history sniffing thing went away. Fantastic, right? Uh, well, Paul Stone here uh, decided that he wanted to do it again. So. How many of you guys have heard of this request animation frame function? How many of you guys do like developer work with HTML5? No one. Okay, cool. I'm not, I don't feel stupid anymore. I had never heard of this thing. I didn't even know it existed. And this guy uses it in a super creative way. So what request animation frame does is this function fires every time a new frame is painted in your browser, right? So a frame is painted just like a movie, right? You have these frames and that's how your browser works and it's going to paint the frame, right? So this function fires no matter what at the beginning of every time a new frame is being painted, right? So um, he, he uses this in a pretty creative way. So let's outline the attack, right? So I, I also, I didn't know that function existed, and I didn't know this is how this worked either, right? So uh, when your page begins loading, right, this is a pretty easy way to visualize it because it's movie frames, right? This is right out of his slides. I didn't come up with this. But uh, so the page begins loading. Uh, it's just blank. Then, OK, you're going to write a bunch of links on the page, and they're going to be blue. Okay, uh, then the browser will fire off, and this part's important, an asynchronous request to the history database in your browser. So what an asynchronous request means it's not going to wait for the response of that to continue loading the page, which makes sense, right? Who wants to sit while the whole page is loading and waiting for each link to turn the proper color, right? It's not important enough to make the whole page wait, right? So it fires this asynchronous query to the history database in the browser. The links are still blue for a few frames while that comes, before that comes back. Then that request comes back from the history browser, and if you had visited that site, it repaints the whole thing and paints it purple. Okay? At the beginning of each of these frames, remember that function is firing. Right? You can kind of hijack that function with JavaScript. Um, so I, I didn't know that this, how this, this is how this worked either. He had a cool video in his Black Hat talk where he actually slowed down the loading page of, of Google search results. And like frame by frame, and all the links were blue, and all of a sudden they turned purple. I didn't know how that worked either. Right? It's too fast for you to realize just watching it because it's just a few frames down the line. Okay, so now we're gonna slow things down, simmer down, now, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna slow it down. So like I said, timing attacks are really hard to kind of make real world things. So if this is a timing attack, we're gonna slow it down. And the way that he chose to slow this down was to get all GeoCities and AngelFire on it and use these really old HTML tools that who has used these in forever, right? And add these padding, these shadows, and you know, weird tags to make you know more pixels are being used per link. And then he makes a whole bunch of links, okay? So let's go to the next slide. We're gonna see. Okay, so this is how it works, right? So you know, load this is his POC site, this is how it works. He loads a page with a frame with a whole bunch of links, right? It's like a hundred links. Um, 
he makes all those links go to the same web page, right? That he wants to know if you have visited or not, right? So say you're going to some site, there's an iframe on it, there's a whole bunch of invisible links, or you know, well no, they have to be visible because it's repainting. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of links, whatever. And um, if he measures the the frame repaint rate, right, in milliseconds. So if there's one slow frame, that means it painted the whole screen once. That just means it all it painted them all and painted them blue and never changed it again. So the rest of the, the frames are pretty quick. If there's a second slow frame, that means it had to repaint all the links and turn, turn them purple, right? So that, and that means you visited the site. So this is just a quick view of his POC site. So he loaded the 100 or so links over there, right? He made them hashes because it uses a lot of pixels. He put shadows on it because it uses more pixels. <coughs> Pointed them all one by one to these sites, right? So just made the value of those anchor tags to these sites, right? So purple is what he actually visited. Green is what he, this program that he's running thinks you visited. So he got them all right. Um, so you can see here these four columns, um, five columns, whatever, uh, is the, these are the, the frame painting times, right? So in this time, it's kind of blurry, right? But you can kind of see that it's at least two digits, right? 70 something, 90 something, 70 something, right? Second frame, zero. Didn't need to repaint it. Third frame, uh, it's either like nine seconds, two, two, it's not seconds, milliseconds, nine milliseconds, two milliseconds, or it's a second slow one. It's a second 60 or 70 something. And all the ones that have a slower one in this column also are the purple links. Right, super cool way to way to bring history sniffing back. Okay, so that was first standing ovation for him. Um, second, right. So now the history sniffing's back. He he didn't stop there. So here's all these new SVG features that I also didn't know that any of these functions existed. Right, but uh, for those of you who use SVG HTML5 stuff, uh, this might be familiar to you. But this specific tag that we're interested in is this Epi morphology tag. So. What this epi morphology does is it allows you to edit a picture, just like with HTML, right? So you can, in, in, in the context of this attack, the ones we care about are, you can either dilate or erode it, uh, make the picture thicker or thinner, right? Who knew this existed, right? <laughs> but it, it does. Um, but the thing is, it's going pixel by pixel to tell if it needs to kind of add padding or not uh, across it, right? So it's kind of slow. Um, so the browser vendors wrote some optimized code uh, so that in certain situations it could use faster code. In those, one of those situations is, is if it's like all a solid color, uh, it doesn't need to go all the way through the picture. It can just go down the left-hand column, right? Because nothing to the right of it is different. So it can just, it's much, much faster. Just goes down the left-hand column of pixels or group of pixels and then just replicates that change to the whole image. In a noisy image, it has to use the slow code, right? If it's not a solid color, it has to use the slow code. Right, so I think you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Okay, then the other weird HTML5 SVG thing that I didn't know existed is FE composite, and you can it has a parameter you can say operator multiply. So you can multiply two images together. I I have nothing. I, uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know why this exists. I don't know what to do with it. Okay, but uh, for our purposes, if you take that solid black image, right, that can use that optimized code and you multiply it by some noisy image, whatever that means, you get a black image. But if you multiply all white image by this noisy image, you get the noisy image back, okay? Who knows? But this is how it works, right? Uh, so you can kind of maybe see where I'm going with this? Okay, so next thing. So um, real world usage, you're gonna frame it, you're gonna, you're an attacker, right? You're gonna frame in some site that you wanna read the contents out of the, this person that's coming to your site, right? You're gonna take a snapshot of that, of that frame because you don't want it to change while you're trying to do this whole pixel <coughs> thing. You're gonna apply an SVG threshold, another SVG trick, and you can turn the whole image to either black or white, right? It's gonna just you know, apply this threshold and it makes a black and white image. Um, <coughs> then you're gonna multiply the whole thing by that noisy image that you have, uh, and then you're probably because that has to be the last step, right? So uh, this is a demo real quick to, yeah, we, we can play it, right? Cool. So this is his Google Google Plus, for, he framed in a Google Plus comment box, okay? And uh, so you're gonna see, this is the result of the multiplication. It's hard to tell in this video, but it's either black or it's noisy. It's kind of a noisy black um, image. I think the smaller one is the noise. So when you see it shrink, that's actually the noisy image. And he's just going through pixel by pixel. 
and reading that, that image of that frame. So if you read his name out of the little comment box. So you guys see how this is bad right now, all of a sudden the, the person whose website you're on can frame in another website and read the contents of that website. Okay, he broke same origin policy by getting an image, right? But he gets an image back, okay? He's getting an image back as a result. So a human actually needs to go and look at this and see the result. You can't like feed this into a botnet and like do all sorts of stuff because you're just getting a bunch of images back, right? Still pretty cool, right? But what if you wanted text back? This is what he said, right? Okay, I want text back, I want to maybe automate this a little bit. Um, well, in order to know what kind of text we're in, I'm taking way too long on this, but in order to know what kind of text, you need to know the font, right? Because you're reading pixels, so you need to know the font to know where the pixels are. So, uh, something that actually has a pretty standard font across all browsers and computers is the source code. If you view source or web page, it's always the same font. Uh, and you can actually iframe in and do a view source URI uh, and actually just source in the source code into an iframe, okay? Uh, and then you can steal anything out of that that you want, right? So things like CSRF tokens would probably be the juicy stuff. Um, really, really fast, this is how he optimized this code. Uh, this is a binary tree of all the hex characters. So yeah, it's got really intense. Um, so this is, this is a heat map of all of the characters lined up on each other, okay? So you take zero through F and you put them all on top of each other, and this is a heat map of the pixels used, okay? Um, it's a heat map in the sense, the red ones aren't the most used, the red ones are the exact half. So exactly half is used on the red pixel. So you pick a red pixel and you can break that into a binary tree, right? And so those are the half that used that pixel, those are the half that didn't use that pixel, so on and so forth, and now all of a sudden, uh, how do you <coughs> so forget? Now instead of having to read every pixel in the font, you only have to read a few. So in hex, you just have to read four pixels, and you can reliably know the character. Uh, with alphanumeric, it's five, and with the full special character set, it's six. You can read six pixels, much, much faster, right? Okay, so let's watch this demo. This is a way cooler demo. So this is, again, the same Google Plus comment box, uh, but instead of getting an image out, instead of doing the whole FE morphology thing, He's just reading the source code, pulls out the Google ID, look how fast that is. Right? Instead of reading his name, he found the Google ID in the source code, he's pulling out the Google ID, you know, pixel by pixel, but he only has to read like five at a time and then he knows, knows it. Why wouldn't your phone number be in the source code of a Google Plus comment box? <laughs> it seems really useful. Let's have some more phone numbers, why not? Okay, so yeah, super cool, second standing ovation. Really creative stuff, he brought back stuff that we thought we fixed forever ago. Um, yeah, super creative. Everyone should go watch that talk. Watch it talk about. He, he has more demos too, we just don't have time. Um, so number two is Breach. Now Breach is another awesome attack that allows you to gather sensitive information from the HTTPS channel. And it's extremely fast in comparison to the previous TLS uh, exploits we've been talking about. How many saw that Black Hat talk? Do you want to see Breach last year at Black Hat? Another really good Black Hat talk. I still got on in 30 seconds. No, not kidding. <laughs> Oh yeah, so a little bit of history. Uh, crime, you shot Crime, uh, it was last year, year, it was last year. It won, it won our top 10 last year. Uh, what Crime was exploiting was uh, a thing that's, <coughs> we kind of went through the whole SSL explanation dance a few, uh, a few slides ago, right? So I'm not gonna go through that, but the, what Crime was doing was, uh, it was exploiting compression uh, on, H HPS compression on requests. It was request compression, right? Uh, and at the time, SSL Labs, Ivan Ristic, who seems to be all things SSL, right now he's having a great year. Uh, so uh, about 42% uh, of sites that were using TLS supported TLS compression. So about 42% of sites were vulnerable to crime. Uh, speedy was vulnerable by default. That was part of what made Speedy fast was this compression. Um, and, and you're going to see it's a, it's the uh, breach is very similar to crime in the sense that it's going to also exploit compression, but on the response. Um, oh, my next slide. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know how response compression works, I didn't know how it worked. Uh, how, you guys have kind of heard of GZIP. It's kind of a thing that you've, if you, any of you have used Burp or and then you see GZIP a lot, right? It's really popular response compression, right? So. Uh, specifically, GZIP is what we're going to focus on. It's one of the things that is vulnerable. It's very, very popular. And how this compression works is if it sees the same string in any body of text twice, it's going to, instead of repeat that string, it's going to send a pointer. It's going to uh, put a pointer to the, uh, 
to the first time that string appeared, right? So Google and Google is the OOG, lowercase OOG is the thing that, uh, GL, I'm sorry, is the, is the same and the rest is different. So when you get to the OOGL the second time, it says go back 13 characters, go forward four, four characters, right? It's this little, this little pointer saves a lot of space in your HTTP response, right? Uh, there's some other algorithms, we're not going to get into them. So, um, uh, so how would you kind of, what does the attack scenario look like? Uh, so say there's some super secret thing that you're trying to steal out of the source code uh, in the HTTP response, and you're, and you're guessing it, right? And you're adding to the HTTP response, and you're guessing it like somewhere else in the response. Uh, as you kind of brute force that and guess it, the compression is going to, every character that you get right, the compression is going to get smaller and smaller, and there's going to be a measurable size difference in the HTTP uh, response. Just a stupid example, say you got all of them up to the T, right, it's super secret, and you're still guessing that last character, uh, and you have an X there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to point and say, only go 10 characters forward, right, because you only got those ones correct, and there's 38 bytes. As soon as you get that T, it's going to say go back to the start of that first training, now you can go 11 characters forward, and there's actually a one byte difference in the response, and then this is very measurable uh, difference in the response size. Okay. So attack scenario is very much like, uh, like reflective cross-site scripting in the attack scenario. When you, uh, when you see things that you're going to say, oh, I'm going to look for cross-site scripting here, is I am typing something in a parameter, and it's showing up in the source code. So right? <coughs> user input is showing up in the HTTP response. You need that. They call it a canary. Right? You, need, you need some way to get your input into the source, some reflective thing, and then you can start to kind of brute force this. In this case, it's a CSRF thing. So now, what do you need for this? Um, obviously, GZIP. Um, very prevalent. All browsers use it. It's better if you have fairly stable pages, because then you can measure what the norm is and the bytes for the response. If they're dynamic, and now you get to do some analysis and okay, what is Reason, what is static enough? What is dynamic enough? It just takes a lot more requests to actually exploit in that case. You still need man in the middle, um, TLS, any version. It can even be turned off. Um, and then some secret that we're looking for, some session token, some account ID, whatever would normally be in the response that we want to target. You need reflection. Now, sadly, you do need a small bootstrap sequence, kind of like an educated guess what the first three characters might be. <laughs> However, the entropy on that is extremely low. Like, say you want to get a CSERF token out, it's like, okay, there's letters and numbers. Entropy is not really that high. No, we, we can guess that intelligently. Um, so, just your basic architecture, basic man in the middle setup where information is going out to the internet to the tubes. Um, we're going to kind of skip the little engine that they built for it. Yeah, they built like some command and control yeah. server, <laughs> and that's how they exploited it. Yeah, typical CNC build. Um, so, you know, you're guessing byte by byte with a random amount of padding. Your anticipating collisions that might occur, and you end up going down that route, back out a little bit, and kind of find out where the problem was. Um, and then you just start beginning by guessing the secret, entering the character one, one after another until the response comes back a little bit different in size, which will tell you that, hey, I've guessed something right. Let's go back to, let's go to the next character. Um, so this is just kind of proof that they were able to pull the CSERF token out of public web access um, at their Black Hat talk. So there it is in the source. Same thing as what they pulled out of their tool. This demo was super hacker legitimate because it had Mission Impossible music playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, whereas with the other past SSL attacks we were talking about, billions, millions of uh, requests, this one was only 1,120 in about 43 seconds. Live, over the wire, a lot more practical. Basically, SSL is destroyed at this point. Uh, yeah, so how do you fix this, right? What, uh, the, the really, really easy one that all of us kind of jump to as security people is, oh, well, turn that thing off that, so, uh, you know, is making it vulnerable. Just don't compress it, and then it's not vulnerable anymore. You're going to get laughed out of every room that you try to say that in, right? Uh, I, I think we brought that up, and, and someone pointed me towards Amazon actually publishes studies that w with the page load time in, in milliseconds versus money that they make. It's literally, like, it, the faster the page load, the more money they make in, in the matter of seconds. So, yeah, make your page slower. You're never, never, ever, ever going to win that battle, right? Um, some other more, uh, more practical stuff is actually focusing on the secrets that they would be stealing from this attack, right? So things like CSRF tokens, we actually at Whitehead had to up our standard of what we consider the good enough CSRF protection, right? So if we push the CSRF vulnerability and then uh, our clients implemented a CSRF token, uh, but that token was the same the whole time you were logged in, 
And we actually had, that, even though that's not best practice, that's actually good enough, of what, what was good enough, right? Hey, once you're logged in, everything is over SSL, so even though that doesn't change, it's okay, as long as when they log out and log back in, it changes, right? Um, that was good enough. After this, it's like, uh, if you have compression enabled, that's not really good enough because you have to kind of assume that that could be stolen sometime during that session. So uh, making the CSRF tokens dynamic per form submit, which has always been the best practice anyway, um, is now kind of the new good enough bar, especially if you are using uh, compression. Uh, you can do all sorts of other dirty tricks with the with the secret. You can you know randomize it. You can make it. Uh, you can zor it. You know, dirty hacky kind of thing. Uh, you can chunk. You can HTTP chunk. You can make the page more dynamic. It makes this attack much harder if your page size just varies a lot and you're chunking it. It's kind of weird and hacky, but it would actually help against this. Um, but yeah, probably the most practical is throttling and monitoring, right? Even though it's not a billion requests or eight million requests like some of the earlier crypto stuff we were talking about, it's still 1,100 requests um, in 43 seconds, which should be an anomaly to the same source, right, for, for most of you. Um, that's, yeah, it's way too fast, right? You should be able to monitor that and cut it off and not let it, not let it get the whole secret, so. All right, number one. So, XSS is back on top. No more, no more crypto junk. Um, Edwin here, I'm assuming that cross site scripting reflected, persistent, DOM. We see that all over. Has anyone heard of mutation XSS yet? Awesome. Okay, cool. New so, there's a fourth XSS that we now need to worry about. Um, Mario is basically just the king of cross site scripting and anything JavaScript. So. He has his PhD in cross site scripting. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> um, he's definitely pushing the boundaries for what we currently know, what the current limitations are. So, you know, with traditional XSS, you know, we, we know where these attack sources are coming from. Reflected, you know, it's typically in the query screen. <coughs> we can see that. We can, we know where it's coming from. We know to golly input to encode output. Same thing for persistent XSS. Now we're typically looking at post bodies or follow up loads. DOM XSS, the fix of that is just to teach your developers to be smarter. I know that's a bold claim. But uh, through smarter coding practices, we can effectively eliminate DOM <coughs> XSS, right? And then with, uh, you know, properly uh, strict whitelist with use of just CSP with XSS protection headers, you would think that we should be able to just kind of stop this uh, preemptively. Well, with mutation XSS, you have a situation where we're giving the website something that is not rejection. The response comes back, the browser taints that, and after the browser has modified it, we have a valid injection. So this can allow you to bypass defenses and you know, get, your, get your exploit in there. So, a little bit of history. Um, Microsoft gave us the ability to modify the DOM with HTML in, uh, with IE4. It's pretty convenient at the time. Messing with the DOM was a little bit uh, a little bit crazy. So, like the DOM way just required a lot of code. In your HTML way, just three lines. No big deal. You create your object, you have whatever you want to do. This okay. kind of looks familiar to everybody. This is this yeah, is, and this is, this is new. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, it's easy. It's fast. It's standard. It just works. How many websites do you think you use in your HTML? If you're going to guess all of them, you wouldn't. <laughs> probably would be wrong. Um, so we ran a quick, just get some couple statistics off of uh, Google Code. 184,000 projects we're using it across GitHub, just looking for inner HTML or outer HTML. 1.2 million results, and seven, roughly 75% of the Alexa top 1,000. So this is nothing to do with basically wherever you see this is probably somewhere that you could look for mutation success. Um, so you want to assume a depotency. We give it A, we get out A. If there's ever a situation where you give it A and you get out B, whether they're off by a byte or a character or just one little thing that's funny, a limiter, a white space, it's something different. It's something that can break a filter. It's something that can change the way the code is executed in the browser. Usually that's fine, because usually the browser fixes things for us. How many people have ever coded something, they forget to put a closing tag in? You look at the source, you look at the generated source, and the browser just fixes it for you. Like, there's your closing tag. It's like, no problem. You're a joke developer for a moment. Um, can't help you out. <laughs> so html5sec.org has a tool called HTML where you can test this. And uh, it's got some rich screenshots that we're going to show you. So here's the tool. It's really simple. Can you it's just a couple, uh, see it in the back? It's, it's not too small. OK, cool. You won't need to be able to read, like, you don't need to read each character individually to know what's going to happen here. Um, I'll show you. So from top to bottom, the first one is where you supply your input. The second one is where it takes the value of the text area and maps it as the inner HTML, which is the same div. 
The third read that reads out the MRH came out, um, and the fourth is rendered if everything back so you can see what happens when it changes. So imagine you have just like FUBAR and a strikeout tag. What we expect to see is the strikeout actually occurring. The third one shows us what happens after we enter HTML it. And what difference do you see there, I think? OK, well, the tag is capitalized now. Which is the HTML spec anyway, right? It's capitalized. Yeah, so like, um, I believe it's HTML4, the spec was that all, ta all tags should be capitalized. That's not a problem, but we gave it A, it gave us B. That's right flag. So if we forget the closing tag, you can still see that the browser struck it out, that content, but we didn't tell it to end the tag there. The third tag, after enter HTML is messed with it, not only has it supplied the closing tag, it's also capitalized it as well. So again, it's making changes for us. So here, if we have div class with an empty string in foobar, you can see that after enter HTML is messed with it, it has uppercase the tag, it's closed it out for us, and it's completely omitted class equals empty string. So that makes sense from a computational standpoint to try and save a site. No matter how small it might be, it's like, hey, you know, we know that that's empty string, we're not even going to give it back to you. The content should be fine. So the same thing here, we have class equals test now. Quote the limited. Now when you look at after each generation of with this one, now there's no quotes around the test. So you see how this is starting to get a little in the XSS escaping territory now. Um, it knows that class equals test, it doesn't need the quotes of the limited. So it's like, okay, we're not going to need those extra two characters back. There's two characters less than browser doesn't need to execute. I guess on some grand scale, if you needed to do a billion quotes, that might save some time. Not sure if that ever happened in the real world, but it doesn't. But now what if we have a space in between? Now you can see the quotes up here, because there's a delimiter in there. You couldn't have just like class equals T E without quotes and then just S T as its own uh, parameter. Actually, no value. You put in a single tick, okay, we still have quotes. If you put in uh, one in the beginning, now there's no quotes. But we have another one. That's uh, a back to back for So now we're not seeing foobar anymore in the bottom most text area. And the reason that's not rendering is because now it's syntactically incorrect. <coughs> Whereas what we had originally is not anything about it. It's just quote the limited test with the back to back. You would see it as a string. The browser didn't treat it as a string here, though, after your HTML is messed with it. When you add a second back to it, it appears again. So now the browser thinks that we have a div tag with an empty class with an attribute named test that has no value. So now without really injecting or breaking the document structure, the browser did it for us. We gave it A, we gave us back B. This is mutation XSS. So now if we're able to do this, we should build XSS it, right? Sure enough, you can. So here's an image tag, source equals X, class equals, quote the limited, double back to on error equals alert one. Now if you look at that top one, that's just a string, essentially. It's not a valid objection. After an area has tainted it, the backticks and IE6 are processed as delimiters. So now it's class is empty string, on error is, an, is a, an event handler running a function, and then because you just do source equals X, it loads up the current domain because the area HTML. We're out of time, but uh, just real quick, because we pay homage to all the security researchers out there, these are the guys at Mario credits for finding mutation XSS. So just pay homage, we left give them a little tip of the hat here. So yeah, what we learned is here, right? So what's old is new again, right? We saw that, right? A lot, the Oracle padding attack and it's still, still being used in new and creative ways. Uh, encryption, whether or not it was the top spot, it was still three of the top five. The community still seriously respects encryption research. I think you can tell with this poodle and the heartbreaking headlines that the media also likes it. It's kind of scary sounding. Uh, creativity, right? Who knew that a lot of those HTML5 functions even existed? Never mind, could be used in any sort of security-centric way. It's really, really interesting. Uh, it, even the creativity that it took to repurpose the pad Oracle attack into uh, into the Lucky 13 attack this year. Um, yeah, and we don't really have time for questions, but we just wanted to thank these are the panel of judges that you know this is a not insignificant amount of work and research that everyone has to read up on to make an informed decision on this. So uh, just want to thank the judges and thank uh, the web security community for voting and submitting stuff. You guys are going to see our blog post for next year's coming up soon. Please submit new web hacking techniques once you see that. You can kind of follow us on Twitter and watch us. I'm sure I'll spam Twitter. And, asking for submissions and votes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions about all that stuff, we'll be floating around the next two days. So, yeah, thanks.
we search Twitter, we search blogs, we're like, hey, what, is the, what are the cool hacks out there? We just want to make this list big so that we can really whittle down what is the most important to the community, not to what any particular vendor or what someone else might think is the top 10, maybe because they have an encryption files. Anything, anything with it. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.